Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Yeah, sometimes you just feel like you have to have a prop. Um, good morning to all of you. It is a blessing to be here with you today. And those of you that are joining us online, welcome. I am Deaconess Kim Harris, and I'm also your Congregational Care Coordinator. There we go. Spit that one out. Um, Pastor Karen is... Um, presiding over a wedding up north, and so we wish her a blessed morning and um, good tidings today via internet. I'm sure she's watching. Um, shout out to those, you know, there's, you know, when you're on the internet or on TV, remember, I don't know, maybe I'm dating myself. We used to, everybody used to go, hi, mom. No? Okay. I was always of the generation that that was the cool thing to do. So shout out to, um, uh, Dinah Myers, who watches us online every Sunday, if she can, and um, some truck driver friends. Um, Daisy is one of those, and she watches every Sunday, whether she watches live stream or she watches the video. She does take time every Sunday to be with us, or every week to be with us for our service. So we want to greet you all with the warmest of welcomes. Um, if you haven't paid attention, on the back of your bulletins, we have the weekly schedule. So this will help keep you informed of what's going on in the church, as well as um, looking online. We have the monthly calendar online that you can take a look at what's going on in the church, just to keep you apprised of activities and places you might want to participate. And of course, Next Sunday is our trunk or treat. That's the prop. <laughs> um, trunk or treat. We are still looking for a few people to um, host a trunk, as well as in your in your um, bulletin, you were given some information about trunk or treat and um, the other churches that are in the area that are having trunk or treat as well. Um, invite children, nieces, nephews, neighbors, and um, let's celebrate this. Um, Anoka's Halloween capital of the world um, in its proper fashion. Let me double check, make sure I have all my announcements. Hands-on ministry is UMCOR this month, um, donations. We were successful in making the 100 health kits. So thank you all for helping with that. And today, um, if you haven't um, already realized, next um, on the November 9th, 6th, we will be starting to pass the offering plate, but if you have an offering, there are baskets um, back in the back by the ushers or just outside of the narthex if you'd like to put your envelopes in there. And let us start our worship service. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. I'm so used to doing it from the podium. I guess I'll stand out here. I am your mother, do not neglect me. Children, protect me. I need your trust. My breath is your breath. My death is your death. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I am your lodging, do not abuse me, tenderly use me, soothing my scars. My health is your health, my wealth is your wealth, shining with promise set among stars. on my face. Let us all sing, all creatures of our God and King.
please join me in the opening prayer, which is a, tradi a traditional Native American prayer. O oh, great spirit, whose breath gives life to the world and whose voice is heard in the soft breeze, we need your strength and wisdom. Cause us to walk in beauty. Give us eyes ever to behold the red and purple sunset. Make us wise so that we may understand what you have taught us. Help us to learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. Make us always ready to come to you with clean hands and steady eyes. So when life fades like fading sunset, your spirit may come to you without shame. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Well, normally I look at this several days in advance and I'm all ready. This morning I looked at it for the first time and I noticed even though they said they sent me the New Revised Standard Version, there were a little differences from what I read in my version. So supposedly it's the New Revised Standard but there's differences. Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make humans in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, and then 15. 
Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils, the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. Romans chapter 8, verses nine, verse 19, and then verses 21 through 24a. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, that the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together as it suffers together the pains of labor, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we were saved. So ends the reading. Thank you, Michael, and thanks to everybody who's helped lead the worship service and participate in one way or another. When I was wandering around outside there before the service started, somebody came up to me and said, are you going to give us perspiration or inspiration? <laughs> what do you think I said? <laughs> Both. <laughs> I hope, anyway. Well, it's a beautiful day, and... Maybe we should worship outside. But our modern life makes it difficult for us to relate to the rest of nature. For the most part, we walk on concrete or asphalt or the floor coverings in our homes and buildings like this. We drink filtered water and beverages. We breathe stale or filtered air. Our homes and our cars protect us from the weather. We use a TV to get outdoors. At least I do sometimes. If only because our circumstances make it difficult for us to actually get outside. Most of the time we probably give little thought to that. And yet the Bible speaks of our relationship with the earth. And every once in a while, somebody says something or does something that calls that relationship to our attention. A lady in Ohio uses fruit jars to provide a safe home for the caterpillar and chrysalis stages of the monarch butterfly's life. And when the butterfly emerges, she releases them. How many monarch butterflies have you seen lately in the last five years? There's a reason for that. The Sierra Club had a poster years ago showing a single flower with the caption, I stooped to pick a flower and discovered it was attached to the universe. And sometime around 1968, the Supreme Court of the United States gave federal approval to extensive development in the Sequoia National Forest. Justice William O. Douglas dissented from the majority. He argued that humankind's relationship with the rest of nature needs to be redefined. He said that lands like Lands and lakes and rivers and animals and plants need to be given standing, to use that legal term, need to be given standing with the courts and the law. That they should be viewed as persons by the law 
and represented by lawyers. In other words, a particular feature of nature can sue for its own protection. Now, before you decide that that's outlandish view, pun intended, remember that it wasn't too many years ago when the Supreme Court also ruled that corporations can be seen as individuals, as persons. That would not be the first nor the last stupid decision the Supreme Court made. <laughs> what it did was it opened the door to the role of money in politics, but that's another topic. The view of nature expressed by Justice Douglas and lived by traditional Native American peoples on this continent and around the world threatens our popular understanding of nature as just something that we can enjoy and use and exploit and profit from. Now, I don't want to give the impression that I come to this with pure and innocence. I don't come to it with clean hands. I have tried to respect nature, but there have been times when my attitude was not good. I have killed a number of deer and elk and other critters for food, usually. And I've tried to be reverent in doing that, but it's not easy. Lots of fish. And if uh, Craig Tanner was here, I don't see Craig, but if Craig Tanner was here, he would tell you that I, I shot a few carp with a bow. <laughs> Usually I missed. <laughs> the stories of the Old Testament have influenced our understanding perhaps more than we realize. There are two creation stories in the book of Genesis. I ask that only selected verses be read because there's too much in those two stories to do in one sermon. And I want to focus our attention on what the two stories say about our relationship with the earth. In a similar way, I ask that selected verses from Paul, his letter to the Romans, be read. Those creation stories, like some others, are not to be taken literally. They are not scientific statements about the origin of the cosmos or the beginning of life on this planet. They are metaphors about relationships, relationships with one another, with God, with the earth. They are attempts by ancient people to put into words, to explain within the limits of their understanding and experience why are things the way they are? They have much to teach us. As Meg, uh, Megan McKenna said, all stories are true. And some of them actually happen. <laughs> but they're all true. Nature is amoral, amoral. It's neither for us nor against us. I skipped part. It's neither for us nor against us. Now, it can be troublesome and it can even be destructive. When a wolf kills a deer, it's just being a wolf. That's what wolves do. When a bear or mountain lion kills a hiker or a hunter, they're just being a bear and a mountain lion. That's what they do. <laughs> they don't have a choice. In spite of Walt Disney. 
When tourists get too close to a bison or an elk in Yellowstone National Park, they're simply being stupid. (laughs) (laughs) And their stupidity sometimes makes them pay the price. We humans have a choice on how we treat one another and the rest of nature. Our actions do and will affect the rest of nature for good or for ill. We have moral intent and responsibility. And the law of God includes the moral law of the universe. How our nation and other nations treat the earth can result in disasters. Climate change is the biggie. (laughs) But pollution is also high on the list. Destruction of habitat for other living creatures is high on the list. There's a chemical that's used to speed up the aging process of crops, particularly soybeans and corn, some of those. It's called Paraquat. Paraquat was banned in Europe some years ago because it was discovered that it harms bees and other insects that pollinate. The United States is still using it. Some years ago, Alligator Alley was built across southern Florida from the Miami area to the east coast. What happened was it interrupted the flow of water from Lake Okeechobee to the Everglades. And when they finally woke up, they put some culverts through the, underneath the road, which helped, but it was not the same. Genesis 1 says that humankind should be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Unfortunately for the earth, Western civilization especially has chosen the first story and taken it literally. We in Western civilization have failed to realize that the Hebrew word which is translated dominion implies justice using the same kind of justice towards the earth as God does towards us. The story also suggests that human beings were created last. That doesn't mean we're superior. It means we have responsibility for the rest of nature. Western civilization has taken dominion to mean subjugate. You are bound to follow our will. But in the Genesis 2 story, it's different. We humans are formed from the dust of the earth. That's just another way of saying we are connected. We are part of nature. But we cannot till it and keep it, which is the purpose we're put on this earth for. We cannot do that unless we take care of the water and the air. 50% of Minnesota's lakes are polluted to one degree or another. Those two phrases, subdue and dominion, and the other two phrases, till and keep it, are contrasted with one another. Unfortunately, as I said, civilization in the western part of the world has chosen the first story. And later on in the book of Genesis, in chapter 6, if you want to look it up, we are told that God is sorry that he made humans on the earth. And he grieved it grieved him to his heart. Now when Adam and Eve eat that fruit of the tree, it doesn't say apple, it just says fruit. When they eat the fruit of the tree, 
The problem is not with the fruit. The problem is with the pear on the ground. Let me say that again. (laughs) Human freedom is intoxicating. History of human has revealed the creativity and the promise of human life. But human history has also shown the dangers and horrors of human freedom. The Apostle Paul theologically links the condition of humanity and the condition of the rest of the world, the rest of nature. He says that both humans and the rest of nature have been groaning in travail, birth pangs, groaning in travail together, and that we humans only have the first fruits of the Spirit. We haven't gotten to perfection yet. It's a long way. And that the rest of creation is waiting for us to be renewed. Renewed completely. In other words, the earth will be healed only to the extent that we humans are healed and made whole. Only as we live in harmony with the rest of the nature. The connection is that strong and that deep. Now, you may think of the Old Testament metaphor of where it says, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. That's a way of saying the hope is there that things will get better as we work at it. I wouldn't literally expect the lion to lay down with a lamb, by the way. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. We need to change our understanding and our attitude. I'm not speaking so much individually as corporately, particularly as nations of the world. Our understanding and our attitude is what created the problems in the first place. So our technology alone is not going to save us. It can help, but it's not going to save us. Some people have even given up on the task and the responsibility of caring for the earth because they believe we've made such a mess of it that it can't be healed. And so they're working feverishly to find a new home on Mars or somewhere. If we do, we'll take the problems with us. Given time, it'll be the same thing there unless we change our attitude. Now, there's nothing wrong with space exploration. It's exciting and it has some promise, has some good effects, consequences. But what if at least a part of those billions of dollars were spent towards improving the earth and how we relate to it. We may be dealing with the old philosophy of use it and throw it away. (laughs) Get a new home. Our European forefathers came to this continent for different reasons. One of the reasons was to conquer the land for profit. And even before they reached these shores, They had convinced themselves that God meant them to have this land, much as the ancient Hebrews believed God wanted them to have the land of Canaan. But the pilgrims, the Israelites, the colonial invaders of Australia and other places in the world were faced with the same problem. Somebody was already here. And they all tried to solve the problem the same way, by seeing the native peoples as the problem. By branding them as less worthy, even less human. And using God to justify 
their divine right to the land. The old might makes right philosophy comes into play there. Our forebears were frightened by this land. It was a scary place to them. And so they called it wilderness. Wilderness. Native Americans had lived here long enough and had learned to understand and live with nature. They didn't call it wilderness. They called it Mother Earth, which implies nourishing. So any any discussion of the land in the United States and Canada must include the native peoples of the world. The whole world, actually. Now, they have not been perfect in their living of their philosophy. But they have a lot to teach us. To my knowledge, Canada still does not recognize the Laplander people and their right to the land. Some years ago, Bill Bradley, the NBA star, some of you are old enough to remember him. Yeah. He became a U.S. senator. And he sponsored a bill in Congress that all federal land, not private, that gets complicated, but all federal land should be returned to the Native Americans. Yes, the national parks, the Black Hills, the lands of Black Mesa and Blue Lake, and so forth and so forth and so forth. Of course, the bill failed to go anywhere. But it's still a good idea. Our lust for the land has blinded us to respecting other people and the land itself. Might does not make right. And as a nation, we have never fully dealt with the American Holocaust. As a nation, we have never dealt fully with the attempts and the actions of the way we treated the Native American people and the land. President Biden has said recently that he wants to make that Native American issue a priority. That's been said before. (laughs) We shall see. We have much to be thankful for as a nation. We have much to be proud of as a nation. But our treatment of the land and the Native peoples is not two of those We may say that we didn't know better at the time, that we really didn't mean to damage things that way. Well, there are eight different meanings of the word sin in the New Testament. Eight. And one of them is a Greek word which means to sin in ignorance. We say that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Part of God's law is the law of the universe. Now, by this time, you're wondering, well, where's that beaver? (laughs) Well, here he comes. (laughs) Not the young boy of TV fame, but the real four-footed, four-toothed, Flat-tailed critter. I trapped beaver in western North Dakota for six years. I learned a lot about them and from them. I also learned that my wife did not like the smell when I was skinning them in the garage. (laughs) So my son and I built a shed at the back of the lot. (laughs) Take care of that. I learned that if the beaver population gets too high, 
They can denude a whole hillside. Especially if those are aspen trees that they love. They can cause flooding where we do not want it. But their habit of building dams is also constructive. So I've always tried to leave a few beaver for the population to increase again. Their ponds collect water so that it can drain off slowly and naturally into the rivers. It also provides habitat for other animals and fish, even for cattle during periods of, periods of drought. On the whole, beavers benefit the environment. Some ranchers and farmers are learning to work in concert with the beavers rather than trying to exterminate them. So the conclusion is obvious. Leave it to beaver to teach us how to interact with the land. But some of our farming practices work against the environment. Not just chemicals, but the flow of water. Putting drainage tiles in fields to make the area tillable and plant crops in works, except it hurries the water to the rivers, then the rivers overflow the banks, they erode the banks and take away as much land as the farmer was saving by draining the wetlands. I had a conversation with a farmer in eastern North Dakota not long after the, what was it, 96, 97 flood of the Red River and elsewhere. And he surprised me when he said, we farmers are partly to blame for that flood. I asked him what he meant. And he explained that many farmers had drained the wetlands to increase their acreage. Sounds fair enough. But doing that took away the natural lowlands or wet spots, wetlands, where the water would collect and then slowly drain into the rivers and thus reduce flooding. They had messed with Mother Nature. <laughs> and Mother Nature struck back. Now, floods and other natural disasters like Hurricane Ian remind us of the power of nature and just how weak we are and how we're connected with the rest of nature and how our technology, as I said, can help us, but it can't save us. We must be careful, I think. We must be careful not to say that natural disasters are God's punishment for the people in those areas. I suspect the people of Florida are, aren't any more sinful than we are. But how we and other nations treat the earth and live in the land does have consequences. And that involves all of us. And I would like to close with a, uh, kind of an invitation or an encouragement. And Kim, you check me, make sure I'm right here. Uh, November 3rd from 6 to 7.30, there's a presentation by Sarah Augustine dealing with her book, The Land is Not Empty, Following Jesus in Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery. The doctrine of discovery was the doctrine that nations developed some long time ago saying that whichever nation found new territory first, they could claim a right to it. Well, you can see what the consequences of that were. Anyway, she's going to talk about that. And she says the doctrine of discovery continues to dis devastate indigenous peoples and cultures and even the planet itself as it justifies exploration, exploitation of both natural resources and people. This is sponsored by the United Women of Faith. I would encourage you to, if you want to follow this topic further, to come to that on November 3rd from 6 to 7.30.
As, as part of our prayer time together, we're asked to remember Sherry, who had a fall and is recovering from surgery. John, as he recovers from his fifth ankle surgery. Kay, who fell and broke her leg. Greg, for strength and healing. Annette, recovering from COVID. And Kim is having surgery Friday. Also, continued prayers for Dan and Carrie, Diane, Carol, and Vernette for healing. Let us pray. Gracious God, mysterious and wondrous spirit, we are grateful for the earth upon which we live. Help us to be better stewards of it as we care for one another as well. Help us, O oh God, to not be harder on ourselves than you are. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to live. We pray especially for the leaders of the world. May they have the wisdom to seek your guidance and the courage to follow it. Help all of us to be a blessing to the world. You have heard the names that we have listed. You know them better than we do. May they and all others that we name in our hearts know that you walk with them through their experiences. Be their courage and their strength. We pray for the lost and the lonely, for the scared and the fleeing, for those who are faced with great decisions, for the homeless. We pray, O oh God, that we may learn each day to respect who we are and who the earth is as our home. We pray for those who are homebound and in care facilities, those who are lonely and suffering from depression in the midst of health concerns. We know that the change of seasons can be difficult when we are not well. We pray for our Ministry of the Month, UMCOR, and for those who suffer from natural or human-caused disasters, be it famine, hurricane, war, flood, fire, neglect, and other events. Oh God, how is it that you love us so. Help us to live in your love and to be your people for the good of the earth and the whole world. Hear us as we use the words of our Lord, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing together. Stand, please.
scientists tell us that if we talk to our plants, even sing to them, they do better. So that's your homework. Go home and talk to your plants. (laughs) But go knowing that we are part of the web of life. And may God give us the grace and the strength to fulfill our part. Amen.